Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we continue our Clone Wars history series. We're in the second year of the war, it's 21 BBY. But before we begin, please do hit that subscribe button down below along with the notification bell. Studies have shown that hitting red buttons soothes the soul and increases your life expectancy. Anyway, in our last episode we covered the Battle of Malastar. The world's massive fuel reserves are in danger of falling into the hands of a separatist horde. In a last ditch effort, the Republic launches a prototype electro proton bomb, which destroys the entire droid army, but at the same time awakens an ancient beast. The development of the electro proton bomb should have changed everything for the Republic. It was an extremely powerful area effect weapon that could take out droids, but leave organic life forms relatively unharmed. For some reason, we don't really see it being used ever again. Sure, it created a sinkhole and a giant beast emerged from the ground, but that was a freak accident. Perhaps the electro-proton bomb was too expensive to manufacture. Who knows? Anyway, after the Republic victory on Geonosis, a small garrison of clones was all the GAR could afford to leave on the planet because the Separatist droid army was quickly spreading across the Outer Rim, attacking many different Republic worlds. The Geonosians had simply gone underground into their hives, and just a few months after the battle, they emerged and retook the planet. After the Battle of Malastar, the Jedi began suspecting that banking clan Senator Rush Clovis was secretly working with the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Padme Amidala used to be close to Clovis back when she first joined the Senate. So the Jedi Council decides to send Padme to go spy on her former colleague who also happens to have a big crush on her. While undercover on Cato Nemoidia, she witnessed a secret meeting between Senator Lot Dodd, Archduke Pago the Lesser, and Clovis. They were discussing the financing of a new droid factory on Geonosis for the Separatist Alliance. This was a clear violation of Republic sanctions against the Separatist Alliance. But let's be honest, everyone in the galaxy knew that the Trade Federation, intergalactic banking clans, along with several of the other corporate alliances, were playing both sides of the war. There was a lot of money involved, so no one really wanted to call them out about it. But the creation of this new droid factory warranted a Republic invasion. Although it's kind of strange that the Republic didn't invade when their garrison just suddenly disappeared. The Republic invasion fleet they send is one of the biggest assembled so far during the war. It's made up of six Venator class Star Destroyers and 10 Acclimator class assault ships and close to 200,000 clone troopers. The Separatists led by Geonosian Archduke Pago the Lesser is holed up in his new factory, which is shielded. He lacks a defensive fleet of his own, and his air cover is limited to just Geonosian starfighters. The Republic could have probably waited in orbit and just bombarded the Separatist base, but that probably would have taken too long and the Separatists would have been able to call in reinforcements. So the Republic carry on an assault, which consisted of three main forces, led by Kiyoti Mundi, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Anakin Skywalker. Their goal would be to reach a staging area in front of the shield and attempt to breach it. They needed to take Poggle alive to end the Geonosians from rising up again. The problem with the Republic plan is they grossly underestimate the Geonosians' defenses. The original plan was to fly directly to the staging area. Unbeknownst to them, for kilometers around the factory, the Geonosians had erected robust anti-air emplacements to make up for their lack of air support. Obi-Wan Kenobi's task force was the first to launch. They encountered heavy fire, and Kenobi's dropship was shot down relatively close to the landing zone. Anakin's task force launched second, and they fly straight into a wall of enemy flak and fighters. Anakin's gunship is also shot down, and he also loses the majority of his walkers. Things are starting to look pretty grim. Ki Adi Mundi's task force is behind Anakin's, and upon seeing how heavy the air defenses are, decide to land far away from the objective in order to save their own armor from getting destroyed. Although before they do that, Ki and Mundi's gunship is also shot down. So the Republic forces have suffered heavy losses before they even get close to their landing zone. All three Jedi generals have been shot down, and their forces are now spread thin. Kenobi forces are closest to the landing zone, and they quickly are surrounded by Separatist forces. They must hold on until the other two task force link up with them. For those of you who know World War II history, the second battle of Genosis makes Operation Marker Garden seem like a cakewalk. Anakin's forces are also pinned down by enemy fire, and with the loss of their armor, they must fight on foot but a giant fortress separates them from their destination. Luckily, Anakin is probably one of the most skilled combatants in the Republic and an expert at vertical assaults, and easily takes out the droid garrison. Ki Mundi's task force still has armor, but a large ridge separates them from the rest of the Republic force. 
Mundy's walkers, which are full of wounded, try to find their way around the ridge and will rendezvous with them later at the landing points. Key Mundy leads the rest of his infantry through a cave system that hopefully leads them to the landing point. Luckily, Mundy's brought flamethrowers as well because he's walked right into the entrance of a Geonosian hive. And yes, Geonosians pop and crackle when you set them on fire. Back at the landing point, Kenobi's forces continue holding off Separatist attacks. Most of their armor is knocked out, almost everyone is wounded or dead. But somehow they still are holding on. Anakin and Key Mundy's forces have managed to break through and are close to linking up. But before they get there, a squadron of Y Wings come in danger close and manage to stop the latest Separatist attack from overwhelming their position. But the Republic forces don't have any time to rest just yet. With the three task force finally gathered together, Obi Wan Kenobi makes a quick plan for attack. Anakin leads a small squad in his usual suicidal frontal assault through the factory shield and knocks out the enemy anti-tank guns. This allows the remaining Republic armor to march through the shield and take out the generator, which then allows Kiyoti Mundi to land with the rest of the infantry and gunships. The Republic forces are successful in taking out the shield and now prepare to make the final push towards the Geonosian factory. Kenobi and Mundi are evacuated for medical treatment. Anakin and Ahsoka Tano are joined by Master Luminara and her Padawan Barris Ophi. To reach the factory, the Republic forces must cross over a thin bridge, a bottleneck that the Geonosians will defend to the last man. Bug. Man bug. Wanting to avoid a direct frontal assault, Master Luminara proposes sending the Padawan into the underground Geonosian hive tunnels where they can access the factory from below and blow it up with explosives. Luminara and Berezofi are quite different from Anakin and Ahsoka. They like doing things by the book and following the rules of the Order without any deviation. They're also against improvisation and usually had a pretty good and solid plan for any mission or battle. Berezofi had memorized the entire Geonosian Hive Tunnel system. While Padawans make their way underground, the Masters launch a diversion attack over the narrow factory bridge. They want to draw the attentions of the defenders, but they also don't want to take too many casualties. The plan works and the Separatist droids send a huge army to confront the clones. But the Republic forces are in for a nasty surprise. The Separatists have developed a super tank. This was a massive vehicle with heavy armor and ray shield technology. It proved to be too tough for even the Republic's heavy artillery and forced the clone forces to retreat. The Jedi then draw the super tanks onto the bridge and blow it up, sending the vehicles falling into the canyon. Meanwhile, inside the factory before the Padawan can set off their explosives, they're attacked by the Geonosians who steal their ordnance. With no other options left, Ahsoka and Barris decide to use a super tank's main gun to destroy the central reactor instead, sacrificing themselves and setting the entire factory crashing down on them. Master Luminar, being a perfect Jedi, is ready to sacrifice her Padawan and assumes that they have died. Master Skywalker, being a flawed human being, will do anything to save his Padawan and begins searching through the wreckage. Luckily, the Separatists have built a hell of a tank, and the clones manage to uncover the Padawan super tank before their oxygen runs out. But the battle is still not over. The hive tunnels that the Padawan have gone in were just a small part of a massive network that covered most of the planet. Geonosis was a terrible place to live on. The surface was completely dry and dead and irradiated, so most of the Geonosians actually lived underneath the surface. With his forces defeated, Poggle the Lesser escapes into these tunnels and is followed by Master Luminara. As usual, she's quite useless and gets captured, forcing Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin to send out a rescue team into the creepy tunnels, which is where they encounter Geonosian zombies for the first time. Unbeknownst to the Republic, Poggle the Lesser is not the true ruler of the Geonosians, he's just a puppet. The true ruler of the planet is Queen Karina the Great, a massive queen bug. Someone call in the Terran Federation. The way Queen Karina controls her hive is by using brainworms, which turn sentient beings into mindless zombie slaves. Uh, look, I get that the Republic and the Jedi are supposed to be humane, but whenever you encounter a hive mind alien species, whether it's the Zerg, the Arachnids, the Formex, or the Borg, extermination is the only way forward. This is why the Death Star is needed. That or they could just put some thrusters on the planet and pilot the planet slowly into its nearby star. But no, instead the Jedi force their way into the Geonosian lair, fighting hundreds of zombies on their way. They realize that the zombies do have a weakness, and it's light. They manage to rescue Luminara, arrest Poggle, and also at the same time send the Queen's lair crashing down on her, hopefully killing her. But unfortunately, one of the worms managed to escape and has infected one of the clone troopers, who takes the worm off planet on a clone medical frigate. Luckily, Ahsoka Tano and Barriss Afi are on that frigate as well, and prevent the worm from taking complete control over the ship ending the Geonosian threat. 
The Aegean Oceans are more or less spent at this point with their queen dead and with Poggle the Lesser arrested. They don't really do much for the rest of the war and then when the Imperial era comes around, they end up building the Death Star until the Empire decides to kill all of them. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of this Clone Wars history series. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.